here, boy. Good morning. Welcome, welcome to each of you to our morning worship service. Let's all stand, please. Turn to page 221. Turn 21. Be proud here. We're pretty proud. Turn to 21.
As we come to the throne of grace and prayer, I always love what the Scripture has to say about prayer. One of my favorite Scripture passages about prayer is found in Psalm 116 when the psalmist said, I love the Lord because He's heard the voice of my supplication. Father, we bring our supplication before You. We cast our cares upon the One who truly cares. The psalmist went on to say in the second verse, For He hath inclined His ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon Him as long as I live. We're grateful, Father, that Your ear and Your heart and Your hands are open to our supplications, to our petitions. <coughs> Lord, You've told us to pray one for another. I especially pray this morning for Brother Doug and Miss Amanda. Amen. It's their home today. I just pray that you would give the doctors and the medical team the wisdom and discernment. I pray for medications that will help guide and direct. I pray for your caring hand upon Brother Doug and Miss Amanda. I pray you might sustain them in the storm, in the darkness, that your light might shine forth. Amen. I pray for Mike Edgar this morning. He's home suffering from COVID, many, many medical issues. You might be with Brother Mike. Lord, we know there with Pastor Cullen is homesick today. I pray your ministering hand to continue to be upon him for his recovery from whatever bug flu that he might have. Lord, many other personal requests that people have this morning. And you've told us to call upon you that you will answer and show us great and mighty things. I pray for our country. Amen. I pray, Lord, Amen. again, common sense and wisdom might prevail in the leadership of our country. I pray that men and women would not be afraid or ashamed to ask God for guidance and direction. Lord, I pray that again that we might repent of our sins that we've forsaken You, Jehovah God. And we've cast You out and We've set up the idols of humanity and humanism and we're worshiping at the altar of Baal. Lord, until we cast out the idols, we know that You cannot truly bless our nation. And I pray that You might bless Your people who call upon Your name, that You would guide us and direct us and lead us, and that we, again, might be people of the Word and people of the way and and that our light might so shine before those around us Amen. that Christ might be glorified and Christ might be magnified by our words as well as our actions may this time of worship and praise be honoring to you in the glorious name of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords we pray Amen and Amen Dear. Dear page 395, please. In my heart, there brings a little of the 395. <laughs>
there's different bugs going around that people have, which have a fever and other things. And uh, so each piece of home this morning, and I told him to stay in and get well, and he's doing that. So just that word uh, announcement. Again, no midweek till we go back to after Labor Day. And the next food bank will be this coming Saturday, July the 30th, 9 till 11. So we'll be having that. And then something in the future I want you to be thinking about, Richard Kaiser, who is one of the most accomplished guitarists you will ever, ever hear. He's a protege of Chet Atkins. He plays a number of different guitars. And uh, again, he's He's accompanied many of the big country music stars. And he's been with us through the years, but he will be with us on a Friday night, September the 9th at 6 p.m. And what we're calling this now, this is going to be a family variety type show. It's going to be gospel music and some, uh, again, some of the classical country type music uh, that uh, Patsy Klein and some, some of that. It's a Friday night, just get together, fun evening of great, great music. And I hope you'll put that on your calendar, September the 9th, Richard Kaiser. And uh, again, Operation Christmas Child is just down the road and uh, getting those things together. And the school supplies are on sale and plentiful right now. And now's the time to shop and get those things. Any information? The searchers to beliefs are missionaries of the month. And uh, we're grateful for their wonderful ministry in the believers. I believe that's all of our announcements. Let's have one more song, Brother Terry. Page 324, please. Three, two, four. Take the name of Jesus with you. 324. <laughs>
I want this man to know how much I appreciate him. He's been here for about the last four or five Saturdays, redoing all of our speakers and sound in here. There's a speaker now for the back back there that you all can hear back there, and uh, so forth. This this fellow has just been an amazing blessing to this church and to me personally. And Brother Rob, I want to thank you and bless you so much. Amen. Mike uh, <laughs> spent his Saturdays here working, getting up, installed. Our monitor speakers are up here now, and uh, which I think is a great improvement and uh, just one of those blessings. Well, the time has come. This is the last message from the book of 1 John that we've been going through now for a number of months. We'll finish up the book of 1 John. It's if this is a bit on genuine Christianity, our confidence in Christ, genuine Christianity, now, I'm going to give you a, a new assignment this week. Starting next Sunday, I'm going to begin a series from the book of Romans, chapter 8. I'm going to title the series, Lessons from One of the Greatest Chapters in the Bible. I want you to read Romans chapter 8 five times this week. Read it. Just chapter 8. Now if you want to read the whole book, that's wonderful. But I want you to read chapter 8. We're going to focus on that starting next Sunday for the next several, several months. I don't know how long, but uh, that's what we're going to focus on. I want to speak this morning on knowing and growing as we conclude this series from the book of First John. Let's stand together as we read this possibly. I'll begin in verse 11 of First John chapter 5 and we'll read down through the end of the chapter. I'll begin in verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that we have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And if we know that He hears us, what time we ask, we know that we have the petitions we desire of Him. Wonderful book of 1 John. Lord, you've given us great 
truths and principles to follow. And now as we conclude this section, that we might know and grow in the things of the Lord. In Christ we pray, amen. And amen. Be seated, please. Let us know it and grow it. That's what we see here in these final 11 verses of 1 John chapter 5. Growing up, I loved to hunt. I started hunting and fishing when I was very young. My first gun was a 410 over and under that uh, I would hunt with. And often I would come home from school in the afternoon <coughs> get my little 410 and go up the hills, wasn't very far, go up and squirrel hunt, and just go hang out up in the woods. And I loved hunting. I've hunted most of my life, and I still love to hunt if I had a place to hunt. But I'm reminded of the story of a lawyer and a doctor and a preacher who all went hunting together. They were on the edge of an open meadow. And all of a sudden, they saw this prize buck deer walk out in to that open meadow. The lawyer, the doctor, the preacher thought, my word, look at that rock on that elk. This is a record. And this is a, a, a great shoot. shoot. And so all three of them raised their gun and they all three happened to shoot at the same time. The deer fell over dead and of course they go out to see who shot the deer. There's only one bullet hole in the, on the deer. Not three bullet holes, but only one bullet hole. Well, who killed the deer? The lawyer said. The doctor said, well, I'm sure, I think I did. The preacher said, no, I'm sure it was my bullet. So, in order to settle the dispute of who killed the deer, they said, we'll take it to the Department of, of Natural Resources and have a ranger look at it. Maybe he can conclude. So, they took it to the Department of Natural Resources to a ranger. The ranger examined the deer. And the, 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 the ranger said, I think I know who shot the deer. The lawyer and the doctor said, well, who shot the deer? The ranger said, I believe the preacher shot the deer. Well, how in the world did you determine the, sh the preacher shot the deer when there's only one bullet hole in the deer and three of us shot? The ranger said, that's easy. Because the bullet went one, in one ear and out the other ear. <laughs> <laughs> the well, I hope what we have been learning from the book of 1 John has not gone in one ear and out the other ear. And friends, in order for us to know and to grow, we have to make sure that the Word of God, especially these wonderful principles found here in 1 John, have not gone in one ear and out the other. John wants us to make sure that we have hit the target and therefore, John now gives us five final blasts from the shotgun of truth. And, and these, these five shotgun blasts are about things that we know. Not that we think, or not theory, but things that we know. I'm sure you probably have observed that in this culture of wokeism, that, that anything that is dogmatic is a front. People, you, you can't be dogmatic about anything anymore. And so in our political correct climate, there is no tolerance for exclusive truth claim. And it seems to me that the more and more knowledge, we have more and more knowledge, but less and less certainty. Amen. People don't know for certain about anything anymore. It, it's a shame when a Supreme Court justice doesn't know the biology of a female or a male. <laughs> they don't know. I'm not a biologist. 
You don't know the difference between a male and a female? I mean, you know, that's where we're at this day of uncertainty. And many churches have caved in as well. We have this, what is called this emerging leadership that says that really we can't know anything for certain, that everything is transitory, and therefore we, we can't be dogmatic, we can't be certain. And so we have this religion of certain uncertainty. It's causing many to bail on their beliefs and leading some to become spiritual shipwrecked. What do we know for sure? Can we be sure about anything? As we've seen in this series of 1 John, God wants us to know so that we can grow and understand what genuine Christianity <coughs> is really about. Now, Christianity is not about a program. Christianity is about a person. That person, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. I did a search this week, again, studying as we concluded this, and I came up with 26 different times in this book, this small book of 1 John, five chapters, in this small book of 1 John, I found 26 times the phrase, we know. We know. Matter of fact, in our verses that we read this morning, verse 11 through verse 21, five times in these verses, John says, we know. Look at it. Look at it with me. In verse 15, John says, let me look up there. In verse 15, he says, we know. And then he says, we know that he hears us. We know that we have the petition. In verse 18, we know. In verse 19, we know. In verse 20, we know. Just in these verses, five times he uses the phrase, we know. Not we think, not we suppose, not we, uh, we, we theorize about it. We know. So John says, as we know, we can grow. And so he gives us five truths that we know. And, and again, what we know, I hope, doesn't go in one ear and out the other ear. Notice, first of all, what we know. We know the certainty of salvation. The certainty of salvation. Now, last week we talked about the steps of salvation. The step begins with belief. And that belief leads to the new birth. And the new birth affects our behavior. And so John now continues. He talks about the certainty of salvation. Verse 11 through verse 13. Don't look at it again with me. And this is the testimony. That's the New King James. The Old King James says this is the record. This is the record. This is the testimony. What is the record? What is the testimony? What has God testified? God has testified in verse 11 that God has given, to, given us what? Eternal life. And this life is in one person and one person alone. And that is in Jesus and Jesus alone. And then he says in verse 12, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things, I want you to know and grow. These things have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you what may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now let's break this down. Let's break verse 11 through verse 13 down. The certainty of salvation. First of all, eternal life is a present possession of the believer. 
That is, if you have the Son, if you know the Son, if Jesus is in your heart, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then you have eternal life. He said in verse 11, notice the phrase, has given. That's eternal life. Notice in verse 12, has life. Then in verse 13, you have eternal life. Eternal life is a present possession. Eternal life doesn't begin when we get to heaven. Eternal life begins the very moment that Christ becomes your Lord and Savior. Amen. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit and you have eternal life beginning right then. And so, again, eternal life is a present possession of the believer. Then we see that eternal life is also a future fact. What is eternal life? Eternal life is a life without end. That's real simple, isn't it? If you have eternal life, then you have life that has no ending to it. Because, as the Scripture says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. That's eternal life. A life with no ending to it. And the eternal life begins at the moment of salvation. When Christ becomes our Savior, we are the possessors of eternal life. Also, we see that the only way to have eternal life, and there's only one, one way, the only way to have eternal life is through the Son. Look at verse 12. He who has the Son has life. Of course, it talks about Jesus. And he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. There's only one way to eternal life. And that one way to eternal life is through Jesus Christ and Him alone. Amen. And Jesus made it very clear in the 14th chapter of John's Gospel, and verse 6 when he said, I am the way, not a way, the way. There's only one way, it's an exclusive way. I am, I am the way to eternal life. And no man come to the Father except by me. John 14, 6. I am the way and the life. And no man come to the Father except by me. There's only one way. And that way is through Jesus and Jesus alone. Again, in this wokeness, in this day of uncertainty, you know, wait, you're, 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 you're making a dogmatic statement. I'm making a dogmatic statement because that's what the Bible says. Amen. We either believe the Bible or we don't believe the Bible. And that's why I can. But our faith and our beliefs and our doctrine is built on the Bible, then we have a firm foundation to stand for. But when we're, when we're basing what we believe on some woke, belief system that's uncertain. No, no wonder we people are spaced out on drugs and alcohol and other things because I mean they, they have no hope. Life is just a dead end street down a, down a journey down a dead end street. And so Jesus is the exclusive way of salvation. And so John wants these dear believers to have this sense of certainty. To be certain. Not, oh, I hope I am. But you can know you are. Matter of fact, in the Gospel of John, as he concludes the Gospel of John in chapter 20 and verse 31, John says, this is why we wrote the book of of the Gospel of John. And he says in, in chapter 20, verse 31, But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that you may believe that you have life in His name. And so, verse 13, John says, listen, there is a way of knowing and growing of the certainty of your salvation. And so, again, verse 13, these things have I written to you who believe. You who believe. 
I'm writing to you. I'm writing to you. I'm writing to you. I'm writing to you. These things have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. And what does He want us to know about the Son of God? He said that you may know, not that you might think or hope or suppose, that you may know you have eternal life. And that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. <coughs> so, again, John wants us to know and grow about the certainty of our salvation. Secondly, he wants us to know that the certainty of answered intercession. The certainty of answered intercession. That we might know and grow. And so in verse 14, he says, Now, now, child of God, you know you have eternal life. That life is in the Son. Now let me tell you something else you should know and grow. So in verse 14, he says, Now, this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. John tells us we can know of the certainty of answered intercession. And he tells us in verses 14 and 15 that we can pray with confidence. We can pray. Why? Now this is the confidence that we have. We can have confidence that He hears us. The word confidence means freedom in speaking, cheerful courage, and boldness. We don't have to be shy as we approach the throne of God. We should be reverent. We should be respectful. But we don't have to be shy as we come to the throne of grace. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22 says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance. Our assurance, our confidence, allows us to come boldly to the throne of grace where we can obtain mercy and help in time of need. And John says, Now we know this. We know we don't have the certainty of salvation, but no, no, we, we have the confidence, the answer of intercession, and we have confidence as we come to God in prayer. Now, you'll notice the phrase there. This is all important in verse 14. As we pray, it's not selfish prayer, but he says in verse 14 that if we ask anything according to His will. Amen. I may want something but it may not always be the will of God. I may be praying for someone. It may be the God's will at that moment in time. God hears. But the confidence is when we ask according to God's will. And did not our Lord and Savior Himself in the Garden of Gethsemane as He prayed, knowing that He soon would be going to the cross of Calvary, that the troops would be coming to take Him captive as a prisoner, and Jesus prayed there with intensity, with his sweat was like drops of blood that came from him. And he said, Oh, Father, Father, not what I want, but what you want. What is your will? And we need to make sure that again, that everything that we ask may not be in the will of God. We need to understand that. He says, we need to pray with confidence. Secondly, he says, we need to pray with compassion. Now, <laughs> verses 16 and verse 17 are extremely difficult verses. Because he said in verse 16, if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, that's compassion, which does not lead to death. He will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin, not leading to death. This, there is a sin leading to death. I do not say that we should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there, there is a sin not leading to death. 
Now those are some difficult verses that I'm not about to jump in and answer all of that because we might be here in September doing that. <laughs> Amen. Jesus did say that those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit is a sin that might not be forgiven. And to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, of course, is to profane Him and, and, and deny Him. And, and the only way we can be born again and the only way we can, is through the Holy Spirit. So, but here's the point. John is saying the certainty of answered intervention is we can pray with confidence, but we need to learn to pray with compassion. And the compassion is seen there in verse 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, that's compassion. For some of us, when we see a brother sinning, we take some sort of secret delight in it. It's almost like we're competitors. We somehow move up a notch if our brother goes down a notch. And rather than praying with compassion, we say, oh, oh man, I, I could have told you that's going to happen. I, I knew that. I couldn't trust that person. And we do all of these silly things. That's sin. God calls us to intercede for this individual this brother who is sinning. Not to gossip about that brother, nor to ignore that brother. I mentioned a week or two ago that I was reading a book by Governor Christy Knoll of South Dakota titled, This Isn't My First Rodeo, Lessons from the Heartland. It was a tremendous book that I enjoyed immensely, and I've passed it along to several people that and I think they're, they're reading it. But in the book, she tells the story. She, she became a, a, a Congress woman, I don't know how you say that in the correct way, to, to, to Washington from South Dakota, a congressman at large. And she told this, she was telling this story, and she said, about Christian woman, and I was so inspired by so many things, race on the farm, hard work, just so many great things but she tells the story that President Obama was giving his State of the Union address one year as she was in Congress. And she said she was sitting in the back at first hoping he might stumble and bumble and so forth and, 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 and embarrass himself and do, do something stupid, you know. And all of a sudden she thought, you know, I'm, I'm asking the wrong thing. I should be praying praying for his well-being, praying for the country. And she said, God depicted my heart that I was thinking the wrong thing. I was hoping he would embarrass himself and stumble and, and say something stupid that would be hurtful for him, and I'd be glad about it. And she said, God spoke to my heart and convicted me. I need to be praying for him and praying for His well-being, and praying for the country, and, and praying for unifying grace to be around us. And that was, to me, one of those very touching stories that, that again, rather than interceding, we often are, are gleeful when, when someone falters, when someone that we think, you know, well, I could have told you so, I saw it coming, and we get kind of gleeful about it rather than the gloom of a brother or a sister who needs our prayers. I'm going to tell you something. I'm challenged. I'm challenged by the words spoken by Samuel in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 23 when Samuel said this, As for me, far be it from that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for Samuel said, Oh, dear God, help me because I don't want to sit against God because I have failed to pray for you. That's, as a family, it's what we do. We pray one for another. 
that's why as a family, when one person is hurting, we all hurt. When one person is rejoicing, we all rejoice. There's not jealousy. There's not this selfishness that often permeates our culture and our society. Now the third thing we know is this. We know that we know the certainty of victory. Now look at verse 18. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. Now we learned last week in verse 4 of this fifth chapter that we are overcomers. Nike, the Greek word. Victors. We are not victims, but we are victors. And so here John talks about the certainty of victory. Now, what John is saying in verse 18 is this. Listen carefully. He's not saying we don't sin. He's saying we don't practice sin on a regular basis. He's saying this. He's saying that sin must no longer taste sweet to the believer. Sin and closeness to Christ are incompatible. I cannot live in sin and be close to Christ. Now many people make a pretense hypocritically we learn all the time about some preacher that's been involved in some kind of illicit affair or stealing or this or that while they've still carried on a pastor or ministry. And again, that simply says that they're hypocrite, that, that they're play, they're actors, they're playing, they're pretending. John is saying in this 18th verse the certainty of victory. I believe the correct rendering of verse 18 is we know that whoever is born of God does not practice sin. We may sin and we do sin. Now I'm going to talk about that next Sunday. We do sin. We're sinners. But when we sin, the Holy Spirit it convicts us and pricks our heart and says, hey, Brother Jim, that wasn't right. That's not the way you should do. That's, that's not the way Christ would handle that. Those are not the words that Christ would speak. And the Holy Spirit brings conviction. And we confess our sin that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. But as a Christian, a Christian does not continually day in, day out practice sin. If they do, it tells us, that again, their faith is a phony. Their faith is false. They're hypocrites. So John is saying in verse 18, we know that whoever is born of God, again, I believe the correct, is does not practice sin. But he who is born of God keeps himself. And the word keeps means to attend carefully and to guard what is owned. So, and then he, he concludes and says in that last part, and the wicked one does not touch him. Which is a neat picture. It means that Satan cannot fasten himself or cling to us. He can tempt us. He can shift us like wheat. But he cannot attach himself to us. If again, we are not practicing sin. Amen. So he says we have a certainty of victory. Then notice this fourth shotgun glass. We know the certainty of being in the family of God. Look at verse 19. We know! Again, we don't think, we don't suppose. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of John simply says, we know that if we've been born again, that we 
are under the control of God. And if we're not born again, we may profess, but not possess. But he says if we're not born again, that we are under the control of the wicked one. And what John is telling us is we can know of the certainty of the family of God. And we see two contrasts in verse 19. Very simple, very plain. We see the contrast, first, the children of God. If you're born again, you are a child of God. And the contrast is the children of Satan. If you are not born again, you may not live a wicked, horrendous life. But if you've not been born again, if you've not taken Christ as your Savior, you are a child of the wicked one. You belong to the world. You belong to Him. And so, he's, he's talking about the certainty of the family of God. I believe it was the Gaithers that wrote and had a song years ago. I'm so glad that I'm a part of the family of God. Amen. The family of God is God's children who've been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, who've been born again and profess Christ as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And so the certainty, you're either a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ, washed in His blood, born again, or you're a good person perhaps, but you've never taken that step of faith. The step of faith says, you know what? I may be a good person, but I'm still a sinner in need of the amazing grace of God. And you take that step of faith and take Christ as your Lord and Savior. Lastly, He tells us that we can know the certainty that Jesus is God. Look at verse 20. And we know. John is talking about knowing and growing. Peter says we need to grow in grace the knowledge right over the sake of Jesus Christ. John is saying here's five things you can know. You can know these things for certainty. And he concludes these five things in verse 20 by saying we know that the Son of God has come. And has given us an understanding that we may know Him is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So here we have the certainty that Jesus is God. Jesus was God in the beginning when God created the earth. Jesus became the manifestation of God when he was born in Bethlehem, he was the Son of God. He was God manifested incarnate in the flesh. And Jesus was still God when he descended into heaven. He'll be God when he comes back. Jesus is part of the triune Godhead that God is one, yet God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. He said in verse 20, notice he says, the Son of God, what? Has come. <coughs> has come. And He is true. He's the true God. Meaning, He is genuine. He is authentic. And then He said, I love this. Not only is He the true, authentic God. But John said in verse 20, did you see this? He's given us understanding. He's given us understanding. If God is in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians says. If Christ is in you, the hope of glory, He's given us understanding. And that's why the things of the Word of God became real and true. So I read my Bible. I try to make it personal. What did He just say to me? How am I to react to that? What am I to do? I try to make it very personal. Because God 
through His Son, the Lord Jesus, has given us understanding. The unsaved doesn't have that understanding. I remember before I was saved, once in a while, I would take my Bible that I got in Sunday school, and I'm trying to read it, and just nothing clicked. It just didn't click. And after I was saved, I would take that same Bible, and all of a sudden it became alive. It was real. It was true. Why? Because God gives us understanding through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 2.14 says, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. We need the Spirit of God through Jesus to discern, to understand. So John's given us these five certain things that we might know and grow. The certainty of salvation, the certainty of intercessory prayer, the certainty of victory, the certainty of being in the family of God, and the certainty that Jesus is God. John says, I want you to know these five things so that you can know and grow. And then, he gives one final one. Verse 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols Amen. I mean, it seems rather abrupt. It seems a bit out of place. He's talking about the things we know and the certainties and all of a sudden he's about to I got one other thing to say to you. He uses the term for little children which means dear ones. And he squeezes off like one final warning shot. He's five He's pumped five shots from the shotgun. He said, I got one more. There's six in this thing. I want to fire off one more. And you see in verse 21, whose responsibility is it to stay for my age? My responsibility. Your responsibility. Little children, dear ones. Now in verse 18, we saw that Jesus keeps us safe. Here we're challenged to keep ourselves spiritually clean. Let's personalize it. He says, I want you to keep away from idols. Again, the word keep there means to watch, to be on guard, to avoid. One of the things that God was the most upset with of the children of Israel is when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai he had the law, the Ten Commandments. And he came down and there was the children of God following the ways of the Egyptians. They had built a golden idol and they were dancing naked around that thing. And Moses became so mad and so incensed about what he saw. He cast those stones and broke them. And he went in He started the clean house. I'm here to tell you, God does not tolerate idolatry. Now when we think of idolatry, we primarily think of some image, some something made out of wood or gold or something that we worship. When I was in Saigon, <coughs> Vietnam, in 1965, I left the air base to go into the town itself. I wanted to see, see Saigon. It was not very safe at that time, but I, I wanted to go, and I did. And I'll never forget, I'm just a country boy from West Virginia. I don't know much about the world. I really didn't. I was so naive about so many things. But I will never forget. As I went into, into Saigon, the first, one of the first places I stopped was this Buddhist temple that was kind of open and out. And I went up there, and here is this humongous Buddha. Fat, ugly, <laughs> nothing to go 
a door. I look at us. And I see, I, I see these people. They, they, they get some incense and light the incense, and they come up. And there's the idol of Buddha. They put it down. And they mumble their prayers or whatever they're doing. I'm not really sure. And I saw person after person after person. I thought, how sad, how sad that religion has duped someone to think this Buddha is an answer to the problems of life and the needs of life. When we think of our doctrine, that's often what we think of. But let me tell you something. In our enlightened culture, we don't bow down to idols like they did there in Saigon and Thailand and place, uh, place after place like that. Do you know the scripture says covetousness is idolatry. I want something that you have and I covet it. That is called idolatry. Let me tell you something. When John says, listen, little children, keep yourself from idols. An idol is anything that occupies the place that should be occupied by God. Amen. That's an idol. I mean, that idol, <coughs> that idol could be a stock portfolio, 401k. That idol could be an individual. That idol can be anything that takes the place of God. That's why in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10, the Lord said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. The thing we serve is the thing we worship. Whatever controls our life and calls the signals is our God. An idol, of course, is temporal. It's temporary. Jesus is eternal. And I ask this question as we conclude this morning, this wonderful, wonderful book. What idol is battling for first place in your life right now? What is it you think and dream about more than the things of our Lord, the things of heaven, the things of glory. I can assure you it's probably not made out of stone, but often it's made with a screen. We're always looking at that smartphone. We're always looking at that computer screen. We're always looking at that video, that TV, whatever. Whatever takes the place, first place, that we dream and think the most of the house. Jewel and I, Jewel and I sit on our front porch every evening. When the sun goes down about 8 o'clock, we love to go sit on our front porch and faces the west, faces our street. We love to drink our cup of coffee and we just sit back and watch. I am amazed. 99% of the people that walk by our house or walk. <laughs> looking at the phone. Or talking on the phone. Have you ever noticed when you go into a restaurant, couples, they don't talk to each other. They don't reach across the table and hold hands. <laughs> Their food comes. <laughs> That's what they do. Yeah. I'm telling you, that can become an idol if we're not careful. It become an idol. Little children, John said, listen, I love you. I care deeply about you. Keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Let's stand together. Father, you've given us a lot to think about. Not only in these ten verses, 
found here in the last chapter of 1 John. But you've given us so much to think about in this entire book. And I pray again that as James taught us and told us, we need to not only be hearers of the Word, we need to be doers of the Word. I pray that again, even this morning, how we can know and grow might not go in one ear and out the other. Lord, we're here to serve and glorify you. Speak to hearts today. May lives be transformed through the power of the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. 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 Brother Terry. Page 162, please. 162. Lord, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. 162.